Hi guys, I'm back again today with another video and today we're checking out the economics of the Dutch East India Company. Um, what does that mean? Well, I don't know. So we're gonna find out. So before we do start, forget to uh, subscribe, click the bell button and let's get it. Let's do this. This is basically like me learning things and you guys are just watching me learn things or maybe we're learning together if you don't know as well um kind of weird but it makes sense also right like just imagine me in a classroom and you guys like a hundred of you just watching me in a classroom that's weird but it's happening you guys are intruding but i like it right so it's kind of like a weird fetish but it works for me and for you so who is winning both of us does this part of the talk um connect to the video no but do i tell you random stupid things every time yes are you still here probably hopefully am i crazy yes so anyways none of that made sense thank you for still being here let's go to the video the reason why you're here trillion dollar mega corporations are a very big deal these days there are about two or three of these companies that exist in the modern world and they are primarily tech companies that have achieved mm. this status by capitalizing on cutting edge modern technology and probably a bit of optimistic speculation. But there is one corporation that has snaked its way through history that may have very well been the largest company in history. This was a company that laid the foundations for modern multinationals and created systems and procedures and expectations that we take for granted today. Historians, economists and business experts have speculated about the value of this company at the peak of its power and have assessed that adjusting for inflation, it could have been worth 7.9 trillion US dollars, easily making it more valuable than the largest corporations combined today it would make it more valuable than the GDP of every modern nation outside of the United States and China. So what is going on here? How did this company, founded over 400 years ago, achieve such astronomical scale in a time before proper economics even existed? Mm. Well, to understand this, you must first understand the Dutch and the creative ways that they pioneered business. Until now, I don't know what we're talking about. The Netherlands about. Like, around the time company? of the formation of the Dutch East India Company was actually a Spanish colony. It wasn't a particularly powerful nation in its own right. It didn't really have much in the way of farmland or even a strong navy, which were the key determinants of national power during this time period. Mm. What they did have, though, was a very active market economy. You see, economics as a discipline wasn't really a thing at this time. That was not to say that economic theories didn't hold true or that there weren't economies, it's just that people weren't really focused on it. The world was ruled by an overarching theory that later became known as mercantilism, which was basically the idea that the world was a zero-sum game and he who controls the gold controls the world. Mercantilism heavily emphasized the importance of exporting more goods than you imported in order to build up more and more gold, and by doing so, limit the ability of other nations to build up their supply of gold. This theory was born out of an era of limitations. If I don't control at least this much farmland, my people will starve and I will be invaded and dethroned. The only way that I can ensure that I stay in power is to hoard wealth and deny it to everybody else. The same was ultimately true for things like trade routes. But the Spanish at this it... time were making lots and lots... Like if you have all if not most of something there's no value right like if i'm the only one who has money in the world there's no value money would never have a value so was that the right decision well we'll find out i mean i don't think it was the right decision by shipping spices from asia into europe mm. where these commodities were hugely useful for things like preserving meats and well adding a bit of flavor to a bland diet 
And because this was so profitable, the Spanish were in no hurry to give this up because, well, if they don't profit from these trade routes, then someone else will, and that goes against the idea of mercantilism. Now, the Netherlands at this time was not doing so great based on this whole theory of mercantilism. They were importing far more than they exported because they couldn't really farm that much on account of most of their country being underwater, and the whole Spanish colony thing kind of put a damper on things as well. What they did have was a far more freewheeling business culture. Merchants traded goods from across Europe, and the nation was a useful middleman for a lot of the colonial powers to ship their spices to other European nations. The Netherlands was also home to a really ingenious system for funding the epic journeys that were spice runs. You see, sending janky wooden ships of the day halfway across the world, often through hostile territory, and then Mm. loading them up with nutmeg and sailing them back home, was a surprisingly risky procedure. Sure, the powers that be like Spanish royalty could afford it, but they were better off just facilitating this trade and then taxing it. Much less risky that way. Rather, what actually happened was that individuals could invest into these voyages. Now, these voyages were expensive. It required paying for or building a ship and hiring a crew that demanded pretty decent wages because there was a very, very real chance of not actually surviving these voyages. The financial risk of a single voyage was normally too much for a single individual to take on themselves. So what the savvy merchants realized was that they could sell shares in these voyages and then share out the profits if there were any to the group of investors. Curiously enough, at this time, the term stock meant the framework in which a boat was constructed, which could have given rise to the term stock market, with these individuals buying shares in these expedition boats. Now these investments were volatile, like a Bitcoin day trader with ADHD and 100 to 1 leverage would probably tell you to cool it. Many of these small wooden ships sank, many more lost lots of crew members and returned with no spices, and so all of the investors' money was gone. But if the expedition did pay off, investors could easily expect to make four or five times their investment. This stock market was going well and everything, but it was a little bit wild west. There were lots of moving parts, lots of players from the Spanish royal fleet to individual captains and even directors of individual ports. More so, there was lots of uncertainty. I mean, there was nothing to stop a ship's captain raising lots and lots of money to fund an expedition and then just piecing out to England or whatever. What the whole system needed was some good old stability and maybe just a bit of brand value. With the blessing of the Dutch government, a lot of these larger expedition companies came together and formed the United East India Company, which was granted exclusive rights to trade in the goods of the Far East in an attempt to cut out the riffraff of these individual expeditions. The company would, of course, still capitalise on the profit to be had in shipping spices from east to west, but it would control the whole process. It would own the ships and the ports and the plantations, it would employ its own sailors and give people a single entity to invest in, and that had inbuilt diversification. See, no longer would an investor's money be determined by the fortune of a single voyage, but rather by an entire fleet that would be travelling between their own ports and also relying on their own protection. That's right, the Dutch East India Company circumnavigated the need to be beholden to the Spanish by basically forming their own navy, This type of business strategy is called vertical integration, where a single company owns more and more of the product process. Normally, companies do this to reduce costs and have more control over the quality of their products throughout the process. What the Dutch East India Company was doing was sort of like what a lot of modern companies are doing today. Take Tesla, for example. It is now the most valuable motor company in America, and a big part of its business model is vertical integration. A normal motor car company will get its components from suppliers and then assemble cars in its factories and then just... And also with that kind of like business dynamic, there's going to be a lot of middlemen and middlemen could like say, okay, um, let's say um, this, the first middle 
person will be like okay i'm taking 50 percent and then the next one will say i'm taking 25 70 whatever so it's just gonna be like at the end of the day you get nothing like maybe ten dollars you shell out let's say um let's say twenty dollars and then your return is just gonna be ten dollars Instead of like you probably getting $50 back, you will just get $10 just because there are so many middle people that try to pay along the way. But if it's just one co corporation or organization, you just pay one time big time, right? And it's going to be like a single, like it's going to be just like a given amount. Like, okay, I'm taking 30%. Okay, and then you just pay that 30%, so you move on with your life and, you know, one time, big time, right? Instead of like, okay, I don't know, maybe Rodrigo is going to say 50%, and then the other guy, girl, company is going to say 20%. So it's like, but they're, they're going to lose more money than even make money, right? So it's a great that Netherlands uh, or the Dutch uh, came up with this, whatever this is. <laughs> these cars to a network of independently operated dealerships and once those cars are sold it can be serviced at a local mechanic and filled up with fuel at a local gas station. Tesla on the other hand is working hard to be its own battery supplier, they have a very incorporated factory system and they own their own dealership network. Even beyond that and for better or for worse Teslas are almost exclusively serviced at Tesla service centers and are charged at Tesla branded charging ports. This kind of integration is great for Tesla because it lowers their costs by cutting out middlemen and also allows them to control the entire product experience. Exactly. What vertical integrations gave the Dutch East India middle Company though men are was annoying. stability and power. They're lots good and lots for of something. power. The Dutch East India Company was not a purely for-profit nation. Sure, it had investors that wanted to see returns on their investment, but the company operated with the blessing of the Dutch Republic, which was at the time fighting rather desperately for their independence from Spain. The company could turn a profit, but during the time of mercantilism, this would mean that it was denying Spain profit. The company was also allowed warships and to claim colonies and to have a standing military and to wage war and enforce laws. The company did really blur the lines between a government entity and a for-profit corporation. That being said, they did still make profits. At its peak, the Dutch East India Company was appreciating by video, close to 40% annually, I'm not tell you which guys. to anybody that knows the power of compounding is remarkable. And it very, very quickly rose to prominence as the world's most valuable company. It employed over 50,000 people, which even today is very, very respectable. It had over 150 merchant ships and 40 warships. And warships at this time were a huge deal. Fielding 40 warships was like the equivalent of Walmart fielding 10 aircraft carriers while still also turning a profit. But just how valuable was this company? Many people will point to the Dutch East India Company as the single most valuable company in history, but that was not necessarily true. The Dutch East India Company was very, very valuable and very influential in its time, but it was not the most valuable company in history. Companies are really, really hard things to value. We have seen this in our video on the rise of trillion dollar companies last week, but companies that have closed up over 200 years ago are even harder to value. When we are talking about the value of the Dutch East India Company, we will explore it at its peak. It operated through good times and bad times, but its peak at least in terms of valuations was around 1637. Now a figure of around eight trillion US dollars is thrown around a lot by estimating the value of a company like this. At its peak, the market capitalization of the Dutch East India Company was around 78 
million Dutch guilders. And this is pretty reputable. But then people just make the leap and say that that was worth about 7 point something trillion US dollars because inflation? Well, no, not really. This is a massive misunderstanding of what inflation is. But let's take this as the most basic type of valuation. And I do warn you, this involves maths. A Dutch gilder in 1637 was ex- I cannot do math, but I can do money math, okay? That's something. I low-key can do money math. Um, I found out about this skill of mine when I did my economics, finance, subjects, not major, just a subject. Um, but then when I was doing like algebra and calculus and all the other geometry and all that crazy things, I was like poor. I was really, really bad. I was like barely passing those classes. But then when it came to like, when they put like dollar sign, euro sign, pound sign, peso sign next to a number, for some reason, she's good. I don't know. She's good. Statistics, I'm okay. Because it's English and you just have to like, you know, it's English. You just have to comprehend it and it makes sense. But then the other stuff like calculus and those are like alien, right? But then when you put the dollar bills, dollar bills, this is your girl. I can do it in my sleep, apparently, for some crazy reason. So, yeah. If it's um, money math, I can do it. So, let's see. For around 0 0.6 grams of gold, 78 million guilder would have been exchangeable for 46.8 million grams of gold, or 46,800 kilos, or let's say roughly 47 tons of gold. That's a lot. Now, today, gold is trading for around $51,600 per kilo. When was this? 47,000 kilos would cost around $2.4 billion. So, you know, it, it's still a lot of money, but it's only about 0.03% of that $7.4 trillion figure you got by just extrapolating inflation over 300 years. Now, in fairness, gold was far more scarce in the 17th century than it is today. The World Gold Council estimates that the total supply of mined gold in 2019 was around 190,000 metric tons. In the 1600s, it was estimated around 20,000 metric tons. Which means but by adjusting the supply constraints, the company would have been worth around $22 billion. Which again, is very impressive, but still puny compared to the trillion dollar figures that we have been led to believe. This misunderstanding comes from what most people misunderstand with inflation. Oh, I get inflation it. is the rising price of goods. Now this can occur because goods are getting more expensive, or well, most often it occurs because the supply... So did they lie about the, you know, the number of gold that they had to make the prices inflate, like to make the prices rise? <gasps> That's a good idea. Just lie about the supply and the number of supply so that people demand it, but then at a higher cost. And you're just like scamming the humanity i think that's literally what's happening in the world to be honest right like oh this is a freaking cat who pooed it and it's rare that cat poo stuff so drink this coffee it's million dollars and we are here lining up to buy the rat poop or cat poop or whatever it is of money is higher now inflation actually tends to be a sign of a growing economy whose wealth is increasing the United States, for example, actually targets a 1% to 2% inflation rate. That's happening. That's a good thing. They also hope for around a 2% to 3% annual growth rate. So that growth outpaces the inflation. But the thing is, the 1600s oh, were poor. Assessed by purchasing power parity GDP, the entire world economy's GDP was probably around $81 billion. There just wasn't as much technology to produce as many things, and there wasn't as many people trading in an active economy. We have seen before on this channel that the average citizen of the United States today lives better than the kings of more than 200 years ago, and this is because we live in wealthier times. 200 years from now, I fully expect that people from the 21st century 
to look like paupers. Maybe mm. the best way to demonstrate this is to look at the book value laugh at of us. the Dutch East like, India Company. Now again, this is something that we have explored earlier, that basically a book value is looking at the value of the company's assets minus its liabilities. At its peak, the company had around 40 warships, 150 merchant ships, plus around a dozen ports and 100,000 acres of plantations, as well as a large inventory of spices. So that last one is probably the easiest to get rid of. Today, spices are so easy to grow and harvest and ship anywhere in the world that they are practically worth nothing. Nutmeg used to be as valuable as gold. Today, oh, it is used to make your eggnog a little bit more peppy. The value of the entire inventory supply of this company has been made worthless because the rising efficiency of the modern world has reduced prices of, of spices, which is actually deflation. Mm. The same is true for their ships. Sure, at the time, these ships were modern marvels, but they are rinky small wooden tubs that don't even have an engine in the modern world. A shipyard could easily produce this entire fleet for around $10 million in probably half a year based on production price of materials and labour, and that's been extremely generous. The land and gold reserves of the company were noteworthy, and unlike manufactured or agricultural goods like ships and spice respectively, land and gold has actually appreciated in value over the years. But still, based on their portfolio at the height of their power, these would have been valued at around $30 billion, which again, is being incredibly generous since most of their holdings were in Southeast Asia, in areas that aren't famous for their high property prices. Now, book value has its problems as well, but if you were to transplant the Dutch East India Company into the modern day, this effectively would be what it would be worth. $30 billion as an extremely generous figure. But perhaps this is unfair. Perhaps the valuation of $7 trillion was based on how influential the Dutch East India Company was in comparison to the whole world economy. And perhaps they are onto something there. As a share of total world trade, the Dutch East India Company controlled a much, much larger slice of the global pie than any corporation does today. It was just a much, much smaller pie. Like around 970 times smaller. All of this is not to say that the Dutch East India Company was some irrelevant curiosity. It wasn't. It was one of the most influential historical corporations ever. It just actually wasn't that wealthy because it came from a time that was extremely mm, poor. I get it. Because there was like nobody was doing it. Of course, if you pioneer something, it's going to be like, what's this it's gonna it's like it's gonna hit right but then when everybody starts doing the same thing then it's gonna lose its value like i said if you have all the money in the world it's gonna lose its value right so i feel like that's what happened to one of the most powerful back in the day dutch east india company final thoughts the Dutch East India Company eventually fell to corruption from an increasingly vast collection of underpaid employees and, of course, oh. competition. The Dutch East India Company was a great idea that was replicated with the British East India Company and the French East India Company and, see, and so on and so doing on. It. Oh, and remember that whole mercantilism thing? Well, as soon as the British and French and Spanish could get spices from their own colonies, there was no way that they were going to import it and risk losing their precious, precious piles of gold. The Dutch East India Company is really interesting to explore. Not only because it was a trailblazer for many corporate structures and systems that we see today, but also Actually, because it's if you understand its actual scale correctly, formula. you will realise how wealthy and prosperous our modern world truly is. Mm. That was very interesting. Hi guys, interesting. I hope you enjoyed this video. A huge thank you to our... Very, very interesting. Like in economics class back in whatever year it was, I was like, what the fudge is this lady talking about? I don't know, because our teacher was a woman. Um, she's still my friend on Facebook, yes. Um, my college economics teacher was a male. I don't remember going to that class. I think I went there once, but I passed somehow. I think I got like 78 or something like I don't know. Um, the reason why I didn't go to that class as often is because whatever I learned from the lady from my high school... <clears throat> 
already learned it so i was like a oh, big ego right so i was like i'm not gonna go to class i know everything and then i got 78 so yeah so anyways uh what i was trying to say is um before i would be like this is not an interesting subject but now because i'm nosy as fudge and i'm curious and i'm older maybe i don't know i'm like oh fascinating and it's not even like it's 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 a very rare economical country to like focus on so that's why it's even more intriguing because i wasn't to learn about dutch economics in school right it's re it's rather american or philippines the economics right that we learn about uh but then no no one else so this was like whoa. So anyways, beautiful peeps, um, thank you guys for joining. I'll see you guys tomorrow. Bye.